Hey, welcome back to What's New with Mead. This is episode two, and uh, I'm your host, Man Made Mead. Today I'm here to answer some more questions about mead making, talk about mead in general. Um, and I've got myself a little, uh, because I feel like last time I got kind of off topic in some ways, I've got a couple uh, things we're going to talk about. So this uh, podcast is all about my own mean making as well as what you guys are doing. Um, my goal is to try and educate you guys and entertain as much as I possibly can. So well, there's going to be three main things happening today in this episode. Um, our main topic today is all about braggots and uh, we'll kind of dive into that in a little bit. Um, but first, in, in section one, we're going to be talking about, I'll tell you what I'm drinking, and I actually have to, you know, I'll pour it here in a second and I'll explain further. Section two, I've pulled some questions from um, some, you know, people on Reddit, some Facebook things I've seen, um, stuff that's been asked of me specifically. So I have some stuff to talk about that in, in that regard. And then, of course, in part three, um, I'm going to be talking about some of my own mead mistakes and mead successes as of recently and some things that I'm excited to do, excited to make. Uh, I think it's important that, you know, not to only talk about your fail- failures, but to also talk about the things that went well and some things that I, I'm teetering with, some ideas uh, that I would love your input about. So t- first part today, I am drinking, um, I'm making a braggot. Now, if you know nothing about braggots, uh, they are a mead and a beer mixture, which means that um, your your ratio is like generally 50-50. Now, there's a bunch of different ways you can make them, and I think that's where the confusing part of all this, you know, comes in, is because you can make a braggot in a bunch of different ways. The way I'm making my braggot tonight, I actually have a beer that I made. It's right here, and if you're watching on video, you see it. Uh, this is, I'm holding my hand, I call it four, full 405 wheat, and it is just a harvest wheat beer, a normal beer that I made, um, and it has my label on it, everything. It's a pretty, you know, pretty chill beer. It's got, it's about 7% ABV, very, very new. It's only about three or four weeks old, um, but I've already drank a couple bottles, and they're super, super good. So I'm going to be mixing this bottle um, and doing my ratio is probably about uh, like 75% beer, 25% mead um, to get this bracket. But I'm going to be mixing it with something else. I'm mixing it with, I'm grabbing it carefully, an orange mead that I made. Uh, this orange mead is pretty old. I don't have my date on it, but if I'm not mistaken, I think it's from early 2018, maybe. Um and it's, I think the orange and the wheat will go really well together. But the way I'm making this braggot is literally just pouring these things together. You can make a braggot by having a mead and then having a beer and literally just pouring them together. There are other ways you can make it too, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. But I'm going to get my ratios set. I'm going to go ahead and pour this in. Um, I haven't tried this yet, by the way. This is a new experiment for me, um, at least with these two, uh, two drinks. I've done this with like uh, Chaucer's before. If you know what Chaucer's is, Chaucer's is a kind of mead. Um, it's generally a 12-ounce bottle of mead. I probably used four ounces, and I'm going to pour my beer straight on top. And I've got probably a good, like I said, I uh, probably need a little more beer. So now I have my mixture, and uh, I think the carbonation will help a lot. But I, I have a, a braggot. Before, it was not a braggot. It was just, you know, a beer and a mead. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try it. Let's see what it's like. Oh, man. Those things mix super well, especially the orange. Um, I think orange and, like, wheat beers mix really well together. Uh, I think everybody knows that at this point. That's why if you get a blue moon, you get an orange slice, you know, in it. it tastes even better. So uh, I, this is really good. The only thing, only problem with my orange mead is that I think the oranges, I think I left the, the rind on the oranges and it might have made some weird flavor as they fermented. Anyways, it's not bad. I'm pretty, pretty content with it. So I'm going to be sipping on this tonight and uh, I'll talk about it more. Let's talk about the other ways you can make a braggot. So we just did one mixed a beer and a mead uh, and I would call this a finished state. You can also make a braggot by literally making a beer and like 
adding honey in the primary fermentation. So let's say that you made a beer, and I've done this before. You make just a regular five-gallon beer, and on top of what you have, you add X amount of honey. Now, the problem, not problem, I'll say the main thing you have to do with this is you have to make sure that 51% of your soluble, is that the right word, eatable, digestible sugars um, for the yeast are honey in order for a braggot to exist. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. It's, it's just a uh, beer with, um, with honey in it. And so if you want to make a braggot, know that 51%. And you can go, excuse me, you can get in the uh, scientific -y details of it all and, um, you know, figure out I need exactly 15.2 pounds of honey for this to be exactly 51% uh, honey. And there are ways to do that. I don't want to dive too deep into it. So I've made a braggot that way before. I've that's the only way I've made a braggot, I should say, other than what I just did, by um, making my beer, adding my honey in, and then letting that ferment. And that's made some pretty good stuff before. I've made a blackberry braggot that was really good. Um, I'm in fact I'm having to like put bottles away to not drink it all because it's really really good. Um, and I'm I've done it a couple other times, not as heavy. The blackberry braggot's the only one I've actually made from the moment it started fermenting. Then, alongside the um, that form, that way, you can also make a braggot by making a mead and then adding beer on top of that. And again, you want to make sure that 51% of your uh, edible uh, sugars are actually honey and so i think that most of the time when you have a mead of course all the sugars of it are honey you just have to think about the dilution that happens with adding beer on top of your mead so that's the only complex side of that and it's all right you know i think that it's important that um you experiment that's really the three ways you can make a, a braggot either the primary a beer with honey or a mead with beer or you can do what i just did and pour this together take a beer that's finished and a mead that's finished and pour them together so i really like them there's another way you can do it well i say those are the three main ways there's another um if you ever listen to the mead house podcast they they have a not necessarily patented version but they call it the ryan braggot which is where you're using like 50 percent malt as your soluble or your editable edible whatever um sugar and of course 50 percent of your uh, honey and so that's another way to do it it's very similar to like making a beer essentially um and it's probably a little more roasty darker in general it's a it's pretty interesting i've never done it that way i definitely need to try it at some point but i really like making them and i'm probably gonna make another one pretty soon um making beers is nice because it's a little bit cheaper it's finish it finishes faster generally like they only need to age of maybe a month or two before they're ready, really ready to be drank. Uh, and if you're doing that with mead, you want to let it age for longer. So let me know what you think um, down below or or um, you know, if you're listening on, of course, Apple Podcast or Spotify or anywhere else you can listen to this to. Um, find me on Facebook and ask questions. I would love to hear from you guys what you think about this. So that's kind of what I'm drinking and how I've, how I made this tonight. Um, now we're going to move into some questions from you guys. And, um, I, I really tried to pull some, just a few topics. I don't want to go on too many tangents because it's easy to do that. Um, and hopefully this doesn't become a podcast that I'm just rambling about everything. But um, I saw, for question number one, I saw, it was a Facebook question from somebody. He asked, um, what's the difference between using like cheap honey and expensive honey? And this is a fantastic question. Because you can buy some really cheap honey. And I mean, I'm talking like you can get 10 pounds for like 10 bucks. Now, when I see those prices, I get a little bit sketched out, to be honest. Uh, there's something about a dollar per pound of honey that seems real suspect to me. Um, I have found that that cheap honey has gone undergone, excuse me, has undergone a very uh, different process than than our nicer honey. That sounds like a silly. Uh, answer, but what happens with cheaper honey is that they 
pasteurize it means they heat it up and they um, filter it quite a bit so it becomes really really clear if you think about uh, like I would relate it to um, anytime you see something called honey sauce which is stuff you get at like KFC or um, where else do they have it anywhere that's like little packets of honey probably is honey sauce and honey sauce is like not all honey it's probably like 50 percent water or whatever else alongside honey so you're losing the true value of what that is a honey and you want that to be um the most prevalent thing in your mead so that stuff's cheap but it, it doesn't create nice meads it doesn't instill the um i would say warm sweet flavors that a like a, a regular honey um gives to a mead and i'm going to talk about a traditional in this case because it's just easier than talking about anything else but let's say that i made a um traditional mead and i spent i found some stuff called honey sauce and i you know bought 10 pounds of it and i used that in a mead one problem i'm going to find immediately is that the flavor of that honey it's probably not going to taste great. I think there's a big issue with um, with those kinds of honeys. They don't have the character that like true honey has. And you, when I think of the character of honey, I think of like a floral, of course, because that's what it is. Floral taste. Um, I think of, of the coarse sweetness, you know. But there's a warmth to honey that I, I get. There's that medicinal value. Um, that comes from the warmth and the floralness of it. And I definitely have never tasted a cheap, cheap honey and gone, this is fantastic. I can't wait to have more of it. I'm always like, this tastes weird. It's sweet. And while that's satisfying in its own right, it's like, yeah, that's not the best thing in the world. Um, so I would, you know, if you're buying honey, make sure that you find a couple things, most important things. Is it pasteurized? Is it filtered? Now, there's certain levels of filtering that I would suggest. Um, if it's like not filtered at all, sometimes, depending on who it's from, sometimes you can get like bits of dead bee and like stingers and, you know, random stuff like that because it hasn't been filtered at all, which is okay. Um, I think that that can definitely complicate a mead in some form or fashion. So I, I'm not condoning um, you to go and get the most filtered thing ever or pasteurized thing ever. What I'm saying is that when you buy your honey, make sure that you are um, buying something that uh, is, is good quality. Now, good quality often equates to money if you're spending more money on it. Unfortunately, I don't think there's any great way to get around buying or spending money on honey. Um, I use Dutch Gold honey because I buy in bulk. I spend you know, however much it is for the, the 60 pound pail of honey plus the shipping. And uh, that lasts me a long time. You might not need to do that. You might not need 60 pounds of honey, but they have other options too, which is good. Uh, that's just an easy way for me to save some money when I'm buying it. So let's flip on the other side of the coin. If cheap honey doesn't have a lot of flavor, doesn't really have, uh, honestly, the variety <laughs> that expensive honey has, um, wh what does expensive honey provide you? And I would say expensive honey often has different varietals. So cheap honey is like a wildflower or clover honey. Often wildflower is cheaper because there's no real control over the where the bees are getting the honey. So that makes it cheaper. Wildflowers are just wildflowers out there in the random. Whereas like clover and um, let's say like orange blossom, tupelo, uh, alpha alpha, mesquite, uh, what else is there? Uh, Baker's is normal. Um, all those different kind of varietals of honey come from very specific places. Cheap honey does not. It just comes from anywhere, wherever you can get it. Um, so with a nicer honey, you're going to get those different varietals that promote different flavors. Like if you buy mesquite honey, for example, which I used recently, I bought a 60-pound pail. I've already been through it all. But it's got a very nice, like smoky flavor it's mesquite it's got of course has a floral flavor which is good um but the there's that smokiness which you can use for different varying meads and i would highly recommend trying stuff like that um same thing for like tupelo honey it's a little bit smoky it's a little more expensive 
but it's smoky. It has um, kind of a fruity ester to it, in my opinion. Uh, Orange Blossom, very fruity, uh, very, very floral. It's uh, often more sweet than other honeys, which seems weird, but there's that. Um, Alpha Alpha Blossom, the one I'm using currently, is all floral tasting. It's Alpha Alpha uh, Blossoms that the um, bees have gone to. So, generally, more expensive honeys provide that. They also just have better character, better development, because they're more pure in, in that you are getting something that has not been um, diluted, like 50% water or 40% water, whatever. It's true honey, 100% honey. That means that the gravities that you get when you use that honey, or the excuse me, the amount of honey you have to use to get higher gravities is lower. That's one thing I didn't talk about with cheaper honey. If it is 50% water, you're going to have to use, instead of maybe like three pounds of honey to get that 1.100 um, original gravity, you might have to use like five because there is that dilution of water or whatever else in it. So while you are saving money with cheaper honey, you uh, are using more probably. Um, that's the biggest difference between honeys is like character and what kind of varietals are you looking for do you want that orange blossom taste do you want the alfalfa or do you want a, a smoky flavor all of those different honeys have different things that they promote and so you can use them well uh just straight up like wildflower i mean it still has its nice character um but it's more it's not as controlled in that what like the the flavors you're going to get now big companies like uh dutch gold they do a good job of being consistent with something that's like wildflower but that doesn't mean that that flavor doesn't change over time the same thing can be said about tupelo or any of the more expensive honeys but i would say that you are um if you spend more money in honey you're going to get a better product you're going to get a product that tastes good from the start and uh, that's that's important whatever ingredients you use this is important about mead making whatever ingredients you put in will be what come out at the end. If you use like, you know, terrible water and you use terrible honey and you buy the cheapest yeast you can find, you're probably going to get a bad tasting mead. No matter how well you add your uh your uh yeast nutrient, your energizers, or if you add fruits, you're going to end up with a bad product. Whatever you put in is what you get out. So I think that's important to know. Use nice honeys. Use honeys that um you would want to eat just normally, if that makes any sense. I guess it's, it's hard to say, though, because honey's good in general. Even if it's 50% water, that honey sauce, like, yeah, I'll go I'll go to town. I'll pour that stuff all over my biscuits and whatever else I eat because um, it's sweet and it's good. That doesn't mean that it's going to make a good mead. So that kind of takes me to my next topic. One thing I saw, somebody asked about back sweetening. This was from Reddit. I don't remember exactly who they were. And the question was like, how do you back sweeten? And, um, you know, how do you know how much to back sweeten? So let's first talk about back sweetening in general. This is the concept of adding more honey to your mead or beer or wine, whatever, to sweeten it. That's the definition of back sweetening. There's no surprise there. But there's a little complication. You really have to understand when you are deciding to back sweeten where your mead or wine or beer is currently in regards to like gravity. Let's say that I'm going to use, for example, I have made a, a mead that is um, the gravity, let's say it started at 1.070, which uh, if I'm not mistaken, is probably like 9%, 8%. And then I use a yeast that can take me up to 14. If I let that mead ferment all the way through, meaning that it goes from 1.070 to 1.000 um, in the after the primary fermentation, and then I just add more honey on top, my yeast have not reached their cap. They will continue to ferment. And the act of back sweetening did not occur because the yeast are just going to kick back up. And if you put too much honey in and you go ahead and bottle it, you're going to have some bottle bombs in your hands. So there are some certain th there are certain things that need to happen before you back sweeten. One of those major things uh, is unless your yeast have reached the cap, which is the other side of that coin, if you did make a mead that got up to 14% and then you go ahead and add more honey after that and your yeast have capped out, there's going to be sweetness. 
Um, if you didn't do that, you need to stabilize, which means you use potassium sorbate or potassium metabisulfite to ensure that the mead and the yeast stop fermenting. So that's really important because that can keep you from having bottle bombs if you are putting a lot of honey in and you want that sweetness to be really apparent. Now, there's the other side of that. Let's say that you want to um, uh, back sweeten. There's a bunch of variables, so this is, turns into a rabbit hole because I could I could talk about this for uh, you know 20 minutes, 30 minutes because you have so many variables and things. If you want to back sweeten and carbonate some. There's mathematical things you have to do there, too. A lot of this is math-based. Like, where's my original gravity? Am I going to be in trouble by adding honey without stabilizing? And I have added honey without stabilizing before. Of course, it just it basically creates... Uh, excuse me. I've added honey without stabilizing, then bottled it, and it basically just created a carbonated mead, um, which is fine. If you just add it without bottling, add honey... If it's not finished without stabilizing, um, and then don't bottle, you've just increased your percentage of ABV. Uh, again, so many variables. Try not to get into it. But back sweetening, in order for it to be true, means that your fermentation has to have stopped in some form or fashion. Whether the yeast get tired and say, I'm out, or um, by forcing them to stop. So if you back sweeten, make sure that you are you understand where your meat is. Has it hit its cap yet? Has it not? And you need to stabilize. There's some important questions. The other side of it is you might not need to back sweeten if you start your mead with a gravity higher than the yeast can ferment. For example, my uh, my 14% yeast I'd used earlier, if I had started my original gravity of my mead at one point, uh, let's say like 1.3, which I think is like a 15 and a half possible percent ABV, your yeast will get up to 14%, they'll stop fermenting, and then you're left with residual sweetness. And there you go. You got a sweet mead without having to back sweeten. That's probably the most sure far way to do it. I wouldn't try to, uh, I, I try not to back sweeten unless I absolutely have to. I try to plan ahead when I can. So again, rabbit hole, I'm going to stop that topic there. I can go into it further. If you have questions, you want to ask me specifics, uh, feel free to ask them, of course, and I'll answer them, but I want to, I don't want to get too deep with that. So that kind of takes me, excuse me, into another little portion, another I, question I saw, back sweetening leads to possible carbonation. How do you carbonate a mead? And there are, uh, I need to do a video about this at some point. I'm just going to talk about it right now. Eventually, I'll do a video. Carbonating a mead is a pretty, there are two ways to do it. It's a pretty easy process, both ways. You can either choose to force carbonate a mead, which means that you, um, you when you bottle it, you're adding the CO2 there, and then you cap it, and the CO2 is in the bottle, and that's, that's it. You're not adding any extra sugar. You're not doing anything that's... Um, or you're, excuse me, or you're kegging it. That's the other way to force carbonate it. You can keg it and then bottle it, and that, you know, creates the, the carbonation. That's probably the most secure way, surefire way to do it, because you can control exactly how much carbonation you want inside of that mead. Is it impossible to do without a kegging operation or that? Yeah, absolutely. That side of the coin, the other way you can do it is called bottle carbonating. If you bottle carbonate, uh, you're just kind of doing what I said earlier. You're adding sugars on top of an active fermentation um, and then, you know, capping it and they ferment in the bottle. There are some fears that come with bottle carbing in that if you add too much sugar, you can create bottle bombs and things explode if you, uh, you know, if you don't do your math right. So uh, generally... Like, let's say you, you're making a beer. Most beer kits, if you buy them, come with the priming sugar. Priming sugar is intended before you bottle to be put in, and then they, uh, the yeast eat th those sugars and carbonate inside the bottle. And they've scientifically figured out how much uh, sugar is needed to carbonate the beer or the whatever without exploding things. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's like um, a priming sugar for like five gallons is like a hundred grams of sugar. Oh, I hope I'm right. I'm not sure. Um, 
Okay, I'm not going to give a specific amount for the priming sugar because it does differ between um, your beers and, and stuff. There are priming sugar calculators you can get online to know how much you need to add. So if you're doing that, make sure you go through and you figure that out. And then let's say that you're not doing using priming sugar, but you're using honey. You might need to know how much sugar is in that honey, which, by the way, honey has more sugar in it per little volume. So you don't need as much honey when you're doing this, just to let you know. So be very, very, very careful if you're adding honey that you don't go too crazy because you can create bottle bombs. And that's not fun. Just be very careful. Uh, carbonating is is really nice, though. You can take a pretty good mead and you know make it sore by carbonating it you can also take in my experience a not so great mead carbonate it and it makes it a little better there's something about that carbonation that makes meads and beers and whatever else taste a little better so i use that as an alternative sometimes um of course if you want to just have a carbonated mead in general without you know worrying about um, about bottle carbonating, go ahead and buy the kegging operation. It's kind of expensive. You have to have the tanks and everything. So that that's my fear with getting one is I don't have that stuff. Don't have a place to store it. Um, it's also just money. So, But if you have the money and availability to do it, go for it. I would highly, highly suggest trying it. And uh, that's... <laughs> I don't have much more to say about that other than just be careful with what you do. So now that leads me to kind of my last little section of the show. That was part two, talking about um, some questions you guys had asked and I had seen. If you have any questions for me, you want me to talk about specifically, um, go to my Facebook, facebook.com slash manmade meadery. Ask me questions there. Uh, always, I always am willing to hear what you have to say. I, of course, we do have a Reddit where we talk about some stuff. Um, and then, uh, where's else? Excuse me. Oh, Man Made Mead Makers on Facebook. That's another place you can ask me questions. Even if it's something silly, hey, how do I bottle a beer? I don't care. I'll talk about it. Uh, I want to help you guys however I can. That's kind of my passion is to, you know, help you guys with that. So let's talk about some of my mistakes I've made previously. Last episode, I had talked about, um, you know, a couple of my mistakes and I'm really a big mess I'd made. And now I'm, I want to talk about some, some similar things. I also want to talk about, uh, some good things that I've done recently. I, my biggest mistake I've made <laughs> recently is, um, there was a beer that I had made and I didn't do it on camera. Um, but I, I've made quite a few beers at this point, and I always do things that are off the wall. I've done like that Blackberry Braga I told you about. Um, then I've made a, uh, what is it, um, Oatmeal Raisin Cookie Stout. That was really good. And I made a, I called it Din Dinner's Enemy Milk Stout. And it was a, or was it? Yeah, Dinner's Enemy Milk Stout. It was a Cookies and Cream Milk Stout. I've made a lot of stouts, as I'm realizing. Uh, what else have I made? A oh, this one I didn't do on camera. Um, it was it was just a straight up like normal wheat beer. I tried to go light with it. This it before this one I'm drinking currently, and I added honey to it. Um, and I did not. I replaced my priming sugar idea with honey. Well, I didn't do my math, and I, I or at least I didn't do it well. I missed something important, and I added. A little too much honey. So what I did was um, basically, you know, it finished fermenting, added my honey in, and well, added, how much did I add? Maybe like two or three pounds to this five-gallon batch, which in hindsight was like two or three times more sugar than it needed. Uh, luckily, I had enough foresight to go, hey, I don't know. I'm a little worried about this and decided about three or four days after bottling it to go ahead and like open a bottle and just see how it was carbonating. Well, it was very carbonated three days in. It was like, Hey, we're ready. I'm, I'm here to here to show up. And, uh, it was, it was very, very carbonated. So I decided very quickly, I'm going to go ahead and throw these into, uh, into a, my 
temperature controlled freezer, which is basically just set at 35 or think 38, something like that. So it keeps them cold. Um, and it brought the temperature down. So the yeast were not able to ferment anymore. They were out of their range because they'd already reached their carbonation level. It was a very sweet beer. So uh, because of all the honey, that was probably my biggest mistake. And what I just did was, um, I had labeled them. And so I gave them to my friends and I said, Hey, you need to drink this ASAP as soon as possible or put it in your fridge. And I had a couple friends put it in the fridge and a couple people drank it, you know, the night I gave it to them, whatever. And everyone liked it. But the problem was, had I not gone ahead and cold crashed it, which is what I did, I cooled it down to where the yeast couldn't ferment anymore. Um, it would have been an issue. It would have been very, very carbonated or so carbonated that it made bottle bombs. So I, I definitely goofed on that and I'm, I'm trying to be as honest as possible with it. I, there was some mistakes I've made in the past and I will probably continue to make mistakes. The thing I want to, um, bring out with that is be careful when you are adding priming sugar and with intentions to, um, bottle carbonate, Make sure you know your math. Make sure you don't pull a man-made mead and um, add too much of, you know, too much sugar. So that was my biggest issue, my biggest problem recently. Uh, well, I always have a big, hopefully I don't always have a, a mistake I've made within two weeks. Um, but there's definitely been that. So let's talk about the other side of the coin. What have I, uh, what do I feel like has gone well? Well, I have definitely been patient with some of my, patient with some of my meads because there are some of them that are like two years old now. I have a couple that are still sitting in one gallon carboys that are now two years old, three years old, not three, two and a half ish years old. Anyways, those are waiting to be bottled. In fact, I'm waiting on one where I'm going to put it back. I have one called the experiment, which was a spearmint tea that I had honey to and made it like an experiment meat. I called and I called it that experiment. It tasted terrible in the first six months because I used too many tea bags. Um, a year and a half later, it tastes pretty good. And it is, I'm kind of at the point where um, I just want to let it go because I've forgot about it in a lot of ways. So my next goal with it is literally to leave it alone. I'm going to take in and put it away where I can't even get to it. Well, not can't get to it, but I'm not going to be looking at it because then I might have the temptation to bottle it. I'd rather it bulk age than try to bottle it. I've done that with a couple other things. I have a ton of meads in my mead room and um, I've been taking boxes and taking two bottles of each one I've made, kind of going like a Noah's Ark with my meads and um, putting them away. So I have like probably three or four boxes now in closets and things that are my 20, 23, 22 boxes that I don't plan to open until that time because I want them to age as much as possible. And if I put them away, I'm less likely to drink them or give them away. And uh, I think that's important for mead. I, of course, am still giving away things because if I drink all of my mead that I make, um, it'd be bad news. So I still give away a lot, but putting those back definitely helped. So I've been doing well with being patient um, in that. And I think probably the most exciting meads I've made recently, uh, the one I was most excited about that I really want to make another one of is my apple pie boche. Now I made this, I made a straight up boche. I got apple pie flavor from um, Amaretti and used it and holy cow, it was incredible. Uh, one, uh, boche is probably my favorite mead type. It just has this character, kind of a whiskey-esque flavor, even without like aging it on oak or anything like that. You just get this whiskey-esque flavor. And I that's been confirmed because I've taken some of my Boches over to friends and they're like, I taste whiskey on this. It's like, yeah. And I haven't intended, you know, I haven't added whiskey to it or anything. So I really like that. I like whiskey a lot too. Um, and adding the apple pie on top was pretty fantastic. So that's probably my most favorite mead. I've also done some off the wall things. I mean, that's pretty off the wall, but like a peanut butter jelly mead, uh, mine's okay. It needs some age. It's still pretty young. It's a little hard. It's my first time trying a peanut butter jelly mead. And, uh, I definitely feel like I've learned a couple things. So if I were, if you were to try it, I would say start with grape juice, grape juice base, use peanut flavoring. Um, and then I actually used Amaretti grape flavoring in the secondary or actually after I stabilized to get the grape flavor to really pop worked pretty well. Just need some age. Super cloudy. Probably never going to be clear. That's okay. 
Um, now, I also, I would love to hear from you guys. While this segment is, um, it's nice that I can admit my faults and tell you the things I've totally failed on. I'd love to hear from you guys. What What's happened? Have you done anything silly recently? Have you done something totally amazing? Is there a mead you made that you're like, man, I thought this was, was going to be garbage? And here we are. It's great. I would love to hear about those things. I, uh, I enjoy getting to talk to you guys, and I think that's important for me to emphasize that I can only talk to you if you um, are reaching out to me or we're able to communicate via Facebook or um, Patreon. <laughs> I don't really use Twitter, sorry, or Instagram. I use those things a lot, and the social media lot side of life is um, is fun because we interact. So if you want to talk to me, I try to respond as quickly as I can. Find me on Facebook, Man Made Mead, uh, Man Made Meadery, as the Facebook group. There's a subgroup that is actually it's easier to post in called Man Made Mead Makers, and it's literally like a public forum. Then, of course, there's my Patreon. Um, that's patreon.com slash manmademead. I have uh, a bunch of tiers on there that you can join, and all the money that you put towards that goes to support me, helps me continue to um, you know, make the channel run, which is nice, um, and I appreciate that. But I want to hear from you guys, so go check those things out. Of course, there's the YouTube channel, and if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, make sure you hit subscribe. If you're not, go over to my YouTube channel, hit subscribe. We are currently, uh, we've passed 8,000 subscribers. The goal is to get to 10,000, and uh, I would love to get there by, you know, April or so. But uh, it's, again, it's going to take your support. So I hope you guys have uh, enjoyed this second episode of What's New with Mead. In the future, I plan on having some guests on, doing that stuff. Of course, it's just getting in contact, making this stuff work. But I appreciate it. Uh, go check out those links. I will be back in probably two weeks with another episode of What's New with Mead. I need your questions. You know, ask them. I would love to hear from you guys. And uh, this, this is a lot of fun. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. And so with that said, cheers. Cheers.